Saturday, May 6th marks the coronation of King Charles III and Queen Camilla. It will be an event attended by thousands. Up to 2,000 dignitaries, including heads of state, and hundreds of thousands of people lining the streets of London, hoping to catch a glimpse of the new king and queen. But put all of this together and it's a recipe for a security nightmare. What sort of threats are being planned for? What will be faced by the security services? And how long have they been planning for this? Well, to find out, I invited Professor Sir David Omond onto the podcast. David was the first UK security and intelligence coordinator. He was also the director of GCHQ, the UK's signal intelligence agency. There is no one better placed or better connected to take us behind the scenes and to show us exactly what preparations are being put in place. David is also the author of a new book, How to Survive a Crisis, published by Penguin in June. And so it's from his research and his practical experience that we can learn so much about what is faced in the coronation. So all this leaves me to say is God save the king. And here is Sir David Omond on security at the coronation. Enjoy. David, welcome to Warfare, and thanks so much for taking the time to chat today. The coronation of His Majesty King Charles III and Queen Camilla is just around the corner. It'll be held in Westminster Abbey with all of the long-standing traditions and pageantry that we would expect from such an occasion, what the world would expect from such an occasion from Britain at this time. But with 2,000 guests, including heads of state and potentially hundreds of thousands of people lining the streets, I can only imagine that this is going to be a bit of a security nightmare, and that might be a bit of an understatement. So David, with this in mind, and given your vast experience and as a former director of GCHQ, can you give us a sense of the scale of the challenge that is faced by the security services in Britain at this moment in time? Events like this have to be safe. They have to be successful, but they also certainly have to be fun which is a consideration that we tend to overlook. It's not just about security. An occasion like a coronation is a grand state occasion. It's got to run like clockwork, but it also, for those participating, for those uh, watching, it's got to be a real experience, rather like the opening night of an Olympic Games, as we saw in 2012. What you always have to remember about events like this is that the date the time and the place were broadcast to the whole world a long time in advance. So every obsessional, every potential terrorist, every protester who just wants to use an occasion like that to get on the news bulletins, they all know about it. And that makes an, a special challenge for those who are planning the security around the big big events. But the key to it is you've got to start with a very rational, level-headed assessment of the threat, or threats plural, to any big event, and the hazards that might come along and disrupt the event. For 2012, I got summoned back from retirement. I ran a series of exercises in the cabinet office briefing rooms with all those who were going to be involved on the day. And we ran through exercises of it's so hot that the railway lines to the Olympic Park buckle. It's so cold. You can't run the trains. You know, you have cyber attacks turning the lights out. All of the potential things which could happen to disrupt including, of course, terrorism, although in the case of the 2012 Olympics, the preparations that were made were so solid that I think nobody even attempted to breach the security perimeter. So you've got your assessment of the threat, and then the planning starts. Then the plans have to be exercised and tested over and over again until you're sure that the thing is solid and uh, off you go. I mean, in the case of the Olympics, the global audience that were thought to be watching what could have, for the opening night, could have been four billion people on the planet tuning in to the open. So you really don't want something to go wrong. And it didn't. There were a couple of minor attempts to cyber attack the uh, electricity supply, but they didn't get very far. And then on the actual day of the event, Everyone is keyed up, everybody's uh, 
just ready for anything that unexpected that might happen. So the Cabinet Office briefing room, I'm sure, will be open. Officials will be just keeping it ticking over, ready to respond quickly. But the main burden will be taken by the Metropolitan Police, Scotland Yard's Specialist Operations SO15, who will have been working very closely with the Palace, with the Home Office, with the Ministry of Defence for all the members of the armed forces who will be on duty or on parade. So it's obviously a very sophisticated level of planning is required. And the people who are doing this are very experienced. They've done many big events. So I've got very high level of confidence that even if something starts to go slightly amiss, they'll adjust the plans, they'll improvise on the day, and you won't even notice that there could potentially have been a slight, slight hitch. And you can't rule out sort of unexpected things happening, particularly with very large numbers of people. So you could get a problem in the crowds or somebody falls ill. Again, there'll be arrangements tuned up, ready on the day to take care of that and make sure people are safe. You mentioned the 2012 Olympics, and I think there's something so quintessentially British about one of the major disrupting factors being whether or not it's going to be so hot the train tracks melt or so cold that we all freeze outside. It's these sort of things that you've got to think about in Britain. But given the scale of the event that is going to take place on Saturday, perhaps you can tell us just how many agencies are going to be involved, how many personnel are involved in this. Just think about the even relatively short route for the coronation. Compare that with the torch relays for the Olympics all around the country where security arrangements had to be made. So this is in that sense relatively simpler, but you still need to guard the procession route. So the military planners with the palace will have worked out how many service people will be standing there on duty. Scotland Yard will have then worked out how many very visible police officers are needed. And then behind the scenes, how many plainclothes officers will be in the crowd just looking out for signs of trouble. And all the intelligence agencies will have been involved in the assessment of the threat leading up to this. And there'll be a certain amount of Scotland Yard monitoring, I'm quite sure, social media, just to see if any obsessionals or uh, extremists start uh, thinking of something. But I don't want to overemphasize you know, the importance. Security is absolutely important, but the people who are doing this take it in their stride. They've done this many times before, not a coronation, but they've done big events. Just think of cup finals. Absolutely, yeah. And we can ask, you know, how long has this been in the planning? But the work of the intelligence services and the security services never stops. It's constant training for these events and putting it into practice. But with that in mind, perhaps you could give us a bit of a sense of the structure of all of this. So there's so many agencies involved. And of course, we're linked in with international partners as well through Five Eyes. Is there a centralised command on the day? Or is each one operating separately with their own command and then linked up through the government? How does this work? The British system, it's been in place now for really quite a long time. And it's based around the idea of gold, silver and bronze commands. So you have a gold commander who will be a very senior police officer, almost certainly from Scotland Yard, given the location of London. And round the gold commander is a gold command. The representatives of all the emergency services will be there. There'll be liaison with the Ministry of Defence, again, because of the number of armed services, and the palace, and so on. The palace, in the case of a coronation, is, of course, as it were, the, the customer, the ultimate customer, and will have laid down the requirements that they think appropriate. But it's a principle, really, of part of the rule of law, that in the United Kingdom, the police have the ultimate responsibility for the safety of the public and the police. Uh, the, you have the operational independence of a constable. So the chief constable or assistant commissioner of metropolitan police will be the gold commander and will be in charge in that operational sense. Behind the scenes, you've got the British intelligence agencies. They are used to these days 
working as a community. So there's no difficulty at all about they will be sharing information on terrorism, not that I see that as necessarily you know, a real fear, but on terrorism, they will be very careful to make sure that the Joint Terrorism Analysis Center, which is based in Thames House, the headquarters of MI5, but it's a joint operation between all the agencies, that they'll be on their most watchful, uh, keeping an eye on the run-up to a big event. You mentioned about the king maybe uh, expressing his particular views on what security should be in place and what procedures will be needed. Will there be any power in the king's hands or in Queen Camilla's hands in terms of flexibility on the day, or will they be most certainly just told what will happen? Well, I'm sure, given their experience of big royal events, they will know perfectly well that there are thousands of people tens of thousands of people involved. And once His Majesty has approved the plan, which will have been presented to him, I'm sure the palace will have talked through exactly what is involved. At that stage, there's a lot of scope for their majesties to say, well, we prefer, as they've said, a shorter procession than that with the late Queen Elizabeth. She had a much longer tour through London in the state coach. That's up to them. That's their choice. Do you think that's reflective of the current security environment, David? Do you think that's a reason why it's No, I don't think it's driven by security concerns. I think it's more driven by the optics of, at the moment, something that is really takes in a lot of London, which would be great for the population to see, might be thought to be slightly over the top. Yeah, economic considerations and the current climate have to be kept in mind, of course, especially with so many people saying, do we really need a coronation in the first place? So I suppose the shorter, the better, the cheaper, the expenditure. Well, not necessarily cheaper. I don't think these things ever come in cheap, <laughs> Well, no, nor should the they. They've got to reflect the very best we have to offer. But I think that sort of consideration of the balance of the length of the whole ceremony and all the other events that go with it. So is there going to be a concert associated with it, for example? And so who will be the performers? Again, the palace will have a big say in all of that. But when it comes to security, they will know. The buck stops with the uh, Commissioner of Metropolitan Police. And we have in our present commissioner someone who was the head of the specialist operations for many years and is therefore intimately aware of how these things are done. Will the entire country be on high alert? Because you're going to have an awful lot of our security services and police forces moving down into London. And one of the things that I remember quite vividly, of course, from the tragic events of the 7-7 bombings is that all of our police forces were up in Scotland for the G8 meeting at that time. Is this something that those who are hostile towards the country keep in mind? And it might actually be more sensitive targets, ones that are perhaps having less of a a security presence around them that are going to be at risk and not London itself. I'm sure that's a consideration that will have been in their minds. And there's still a large number of security personnel and police available outside London. And the sort of organised Al-Qaeda plot that tragically we saw on 9-11 in the United States and then on 7-7 in London is much less likely than much smaller scale activity as we saw a few years ago. I mean, we do live in very different times to them, but still very tense times. Terrorism is, of course, a severe threat, but old threats have re-emerged from an offensive Russia that is very well versed in how to do clandestine operations and to operate in the UK. We only need to think about the poisonings in Salisbury as a clear example of this. And then there's the renewed factions of the IRA that have been moved up to a severe level threat. Does this worry you, David? Are you worried about the safety of the event at all? No, because I've got a very high degree of confidence, having been part of the system, confidence in how these things are done. There's always room for the unexpected, for the royal family over decades and decades. There's always been the threat of the obsessional individual who really has slightly lost their sense of equilibrium. But that's, again, the royal protection team are well used to coping with individuals. And the threat of protests, 
you know, we've seen recently there are groups that want the publicity and are prepared to risk themselves gluing themselves to motorways and so on. And again, you can be sure that authorities will have thought ahead about how they would very quickly neutralise such protests so that it doesn't disturb the event itself. Well, David, you have settled our minds for now, at least. But before I let you go, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the latest trance of security breaches that have taken place out of the Pentagon. It said that a young officer, Jack Taxiera, who leaked vital documents regarding the war in Ukraine, may have access to still more of a trove of classified files. What threat do you think this poses to Britain and perhaps the coronation itself? I doubt that the coronation is directly affected because the material that seems to have been leaked, as it were, is not quite in date terms relevant to that. But it's a very serious breach. It's from the what has been exposed in the newspapers, I've got no inside knowledge, but from what I've seen in the newspapers, this is material of the utmost sensitivity. And of course, it's come through what I suppose today in the digital world, we've got to accept that individuals have the potential to access a lot of material digitally and you copy it, you can get it out. In this case, it doesn't look like espionage. It's a, a story of an extraordinary individual seeking bragging rights over his friends by showing them material which would never, ever, ever have left the secure confines of the uh, classified system that it was on. There's not a lot you can do, I think, to restrict digital information. A lot of people around the world in the US military need to have access, so they have a system which will deliver it to them. The challenge for the future is building a system which compartmentalizes information. So you only get to see the information that you've been authorized to see. And the technician in the basement the Edward Snowden, if you like, can't access the material, the content, although obviously it sees the material passing backwards and forwards. That's the sort of security that will have to be devised for the uh, digital age. But it is a very serious leak. Well, you mentioned this compromising of digital systems, and I know you have a new book out, How to Survive a Crisis, published by Penguin this year. Are they the sort of crises and threats you see in the future? Is it purely about cyber attacks and espionage? Is this a harking back to a Cold War mentality with spies, but online and in a very 21st century kind of way? The digital world now is not going away, and we're utterly dependent on the internet, as our conversation today demonstrates, you're in the United States, I'm in London. How could we possibly do this without the internet? So we're dependent on this stuff and we've got to learn to be much more secure in the way we use it. In my book, I've got a couple of chapters about real digital crises that we've had in the last couple of years, including the WannaCry attacks, which seriously affected a significant number of hospital trusts. Suddenly, they couldn't access the data on their systems, patient details. They couldn't access the scans from the CT. And because all of that material is digital, it's all sitting on hospital networks. When those networks go down, nurses and medical staff are resorting to pencil and paper and their private mobile phones to send WhatsApp messages to each other. So this could happen to anyone at any time. And in the book, each chapter is sort of case studies of crises we've had. There's a list of do's and don'ts, things that we should learn from experience. A little bit of preparation. I mean, the theme of the book is that not every emergency needs to be a crisis. And not every crisis has to end in disaster. But it all depends on our resilience. It depends whether we've had the wit to take some basic precautions, storing digital information, backing it up in a secure cloud, for example. So even if the ransomware criminals hit you, it's awkward, it'd be inconvenient, but it's not the end of the world. But there's one other aspect of thinking about crises, which I cover in the book, which is what I call the slow burn crises. 
And these are the ones that have already started, but we don't know that. <laughs> it's, it's like you go for a walk in a forest, you throw away a cigarette stub, it lands on a bit of dry moss, it can smolder away, then the wind changes and suddenly you've got a raging forest fire. And the trick to being safer in society is to spot those problems early enough to do something about it. Because if you wait, they get worse and they're worse and worse, and then suddenly they burst into flames. And if you think about the conditions in British society today, or indeed any society, you can see there are problems building up. It's usually, it's a bit difficult for governments to take action early enough. Uh, we saw a little bit of this at the time of the pandemic. Once it becomes clear you've got a real problem on your hands, then of course governments do act. Well, David, thank you so much for giving us an insight into your work and the work that's gone into securing the coronation on Saturday. And as a reminder to our listeners around the world, How to Survive a Crisis is out in June and available via the link in our show notes. So, David, thank you so much for your time. You're always welcome on the Warfare Podcast. Thanks, James. It's been fun. Thanks for listening. But before you go, a reminder that you can now follow along online on Twitter at HistoryHitWW2 on Instagram at James Rogers History and on TikTok also at James Rogers History. You can also subscribe to our free Warfare Wednesdays newsletter via the link in the show notes. Mm-hmm.